Hello and welcome to the epilogue for the Art Restoration Fail video. Now after each video that I post, I take questions from my Patreon subscribers and I answer them in a follow-up video, this video. And those questions range from simple to complicated to probing and they're always really great. And this allows me to not only answer questions that I didn't answer in the video, but to talk about the project a little bit more and give some depth not only to the project, but to what I do here in the conservation studio. Now normally these videos are for Patreon on subscribers only, but every once in a while they allow me to post one for the larger YouTube audience because they think that it's really valuable and they're just awesome people. So thank you Patreon subscribers and let's get into it. Nikki asked, did the owner know just how bad the quote unquote restoration was? Did they have any inkling of what lay beneath the applied with a spatula paint layer? And if they didn't, I'm curious why they bought the paintings. Did they buy them to rescue them? In which case, well done. So this client had owned these paintings for a very long time and had decided that they were ready for conservation. They were a little loose on the stretchers, waves and ripples had appeared, there was dirt and surface grime, and there was also an old varnish. There were also a couple of little nicks and things that needed to be touched up. So they found somebody local to them who professed that they knew how to practice conservation. This was a local artist who also did some framing work and kind of dabbled in all the other fields of the arts. They trusted this person, they believed in this person, and this person did, well, this person did what this person did. We all know, we saw it. The client received the pieces back and was heartbroken, knew instantly that this was not how conservation should have been done, but didn't know what to do until they came across my videos on YouTube, and I'm not sure which one, but I think it was one of the more complicated or more disastrous, previously more disastrous projects that I worked on. And they reached out to me and they said, we have these paintings and we're embarrassed what happened to them, but we'd like to send them to you to see if something can be done. They sent me some photographs, but I couldn't quite tell what was going on with the pieces. When I received the pieces, I opened them up and was just horrified, as I'm sure all of you were, when. I saw them. It was just unbelievable what had been done to these pieces. Now the saving grace was that it was only about, oh what, 2013? So, you know, 15 years old, give or take. And that meant that the work was young enough that the likelihood that I would be able to remove it was very high. Now I didn't know what lay beneath the paintings and that was a big question. The client assured me that they were beautiful and that everything would be fine. <laughs> But of course I had to do the work and that was a big question. Not only how to get the old work off, but what I was going to find underneath. Now TG asked a really great follow-up question. Would you have been able to x-ray or use infrared imaging on the painting if needed to see if it would be worth conserving or at least to see what was underneath? Yes, uh, potentially. Now, when I receive a painting, I do a comprehensive intake evaluation. That starts off with just looking at the painting with my naked eyes and seeing what I see, looking at it with a raking light and seeing the textural differences. And then I start to look at it under ultraviolet light. Now, ultraviolet light is a really valuable tool in the conservator's toolkit because it allows us to see how different materials fluoresce or react to ultraviolet light. Now, some varnishes fluoresce bright green, and we can see that under UV, and old overpaint or new overpaint will often fluoresce darker or purple black if it is fluorescing at all. Now, the problem with this painting, unlike other paintings where we have a section of overpaint that we can clearly see the difference between the old and new, because the old won't fluoresce as much as the new, the new will fluoresce a lot, and that kind of indicates that it's new work, is that this painting was completely overpainted. So there was nothing to fluoresce against. I looked at the painting under blacklight and it just looked like a painting. But that's because everything was fluorescing. The entire painting had been overpainted. There was nothing original left as a baseline to compare to the new retouching. So unfortunately, in this case, one of the most valuable tools that conservators have, UV light, just wasn't really all that helpful. Now, of course, I knew that these had been worked on. The client had told me there was an inscription on the back telling me, and I could see with my bare eyes, as you all could, that old work had been done. So I didn't feel it was necessary to break out the infrared camera or to have x-ray imaging done, because that wasn't going to tell me much more than I could see with my bare eyes and 
you know, trust the client that there was a painting underneath. Now, I still had to do the work, and that's where things got a little bit more interesting. So Stephen asked, is it the case that the paintings had no varnish originally, or was it that the solvent you used to remove both the varnish and the overpaint and any dirt? Did the previous quote-unquote conservator paint directly onto the old painting, or did he at least put an isolation varnish on? There was no isolation varnish on, and there was no old uh, varnish. So I suspect that the previous person who worked on this painting did clean it to some degree, removed all the surface grime, and then removed all the old varnish. I suspect that in that cleaning process, the painting was lightly skinned. And skinning is a term that we use in conservation to describe when the topmost layer of the painting is removed. So if you think of the canvas like my knuckles and the top layer of paint just kind of being skinned off of the canvas, that can happen sometimes when the approach is too aggressive, the solvents are incorrect, or somebody just doesn't know what they're doing and runs into a situation where maybe there are glazes or delicate paint layers. So there was no isolation layer, there was no barrier layer, there was no old varnish. This could have been catastrophic. In 60 or 70 years, that oil paint would have likely been permanently bonded to the original oil paint layer. Now, in the case when somebody overpaints directly on grime, dirt, or an old varnish, that can act as a release layer, and we can, we can attack that layer because it's more vulnerable than the overpaint, and that can kind of allow us to take off the overpaint. But in this case, there wasn't. So we got very lucky that the old work was relatively young and still susceptible and receptive to the suite of solvents that I employed to remove it. Now onto the actual painting itself. Amy asked, what happened to the canvas on the reverse of the face? It looks discolored. Was it caused by something in the paint used? Was there no gesso or ground layer to protect the canvas from the paint layer? Yes, in effect. Uh, when an artist prepares a canvas, they size the canvas and then they put a ground layer on. And those do two things. One, it creates a really beautiful surface to paint on, but also it protects the canvas from the oil. Oil on canvas will deteriorate the canvas, so the canvas needs to be protected. Now in this case, I think that this was a homemade canvas by the artist and they used a very, very thin ground and there was no sizing in the canvas. And the lack of sizing and the really thin ground allowed the oil, which is the binder in oil paint, to penetrate through and to that canvas layer, and it discolored it. Now, luckily, it didn't do much damage to it. The canvas wasn't deteriorated, but I have seen instances where the oil has uh, compromised the canvas, and then we have to take structural action. This wasn't the case, and we got lucky. Now, while we're talking about the back of the painting, Liz asked a question about the adhesive that was on the back. Have you ever tried to use a natural rubber pickup for removing glues? I use them all the time in design school to remove rubber cement. So the adhesive on the back was this person's failed attempt at a stabilization technique known as an adhesive impregnation. And that's where when the paint layer is unstable, let's say it's lifting or cracking or flaking, we can use an adhesive injected into the back of the canvas that penetrates through the back of the canvas up into all of the nooks and crannies and voids. And then we can use heat and pressure to activate that adhesive and bond that flaking paint back down to the canvas. Now we use a conser conservation grade adhesive that is both archival and reversible. This was not that. This was probably some adhesive that was purchased at a home center or art store or online and had no business being near paintings. And as you saw, the adhesive didn't even penetrate into the canvas. It just sat on the surface. So it was pointless. It had no utility and it wasn't doing anything. Ergo, it needed to be removed. Now, unfortunately, I would have loved to have been able to use a solvent just to lift it off or heat and let the hot table do the work, or even scraping. Though I'm not fond of scraping, it is a very uh, successful approach. Unfortunately, none of that would work. I had to use the approach that I took. Now, if I would have tried using an eraser, the solvent would have compromised the eraser or melted it, and then I would have ended up smearing eraser all over the back and made more work for myself. So I had to use my hands. Now I tried using nitro gloves, latex gloves. I tried using silicone gloves. I tried using even uh, deerskin gloves, but none of them would work as well as my hands. And unfortunately, that just was what it was. But that brings up another great question from Ronnie. 
Now he said, I was worried about your bare hands touching the chemical solvents. Do you have to touch solvents more than you would like to? How can they be harmful to you? You said it was sore on your fingers, but was it due to rubbing your fingers on the canvas, right? Hopefully not the solvents. Nobody likes to handle solvents. It's one of the tenets of conservation that best practice is to not only protect the painting, but to protect the practitioner themselves. And we do wear gloves almost all the time, but in this case, we couldn't. Now, I don't like to handle solvents, and I've really, really tried to limit my exposure to them, to look for less caustic, less harmful ones where there are analogs. And luckily, the chemists among us come up with wonderful products that can simulate some of the more nasty solvents, but are more acceptable. But sometimes, unfortunately, you come to a hard situation where you just have to do what's going to be best for the painting. And uh, this was one of those situations. And while I don't like it, and I prefer not to do it, and I would like to limit that, you know, if it happens once a year or twice a year, so be it. It's kind of one of the hazards of the job. Still on the back, let's talk about that signature. <laughs> Alexa said, if you hadn't been able to remove the signature from the canvas, what would you do? Leave it? Black it out? <laughs> I don't know, it's a really good question. I would prefer not to black it out because that would just be adding more excessive and bad work and kind of perpetuating what was done to the painting that was so problematic. Of course, ideally, I would be able to remove it. Now, if I hadn't been able to remove it, if it was maybe Sharpie just directly on the raw canvas and the canvas had really absorbed it, I mean, it is what it is. There's nothing I can do. I can put in my notes uh, that I sent to the client about the project that this uh, signature was from the last conservation, all attempts were made to remove it, but nothing could be done, and just hope that everybody understands that's the case. But, you know, sometimes you run into a situation where there is no solution, and you just have to accept that this is what it is. This is part of the painting. Such is the case often when we find very, very old retouching. Think 250, 300 years old retouching. Well, at that age, it's now just part of the painting. There's almost nothing that can be done to remove that old retouching. So sometimes in that case, we will retouch over it so that the color matches because sometimes it, it's changed colors. Uh, but sometimes there's nothing we can do. So I guess I could have retouched over this old signature, but ultimately you'd still be able to see it and it would raise more questions than answers. And so in that case, I guess I just would have left it. I would have felt bad about it and it would have kind of bugged me and haunted me, but you know, sometimes it is what it is. Still on this signature, <laughs> Natalie said, Julian, it speaks volumes of you as a professional that you completely obscured the signature from the camera at all points and did your best not to show frustration or mirth at them. Do you see the beginning of the video? I think I showed my frustration pretty well. Um, Look, I mean, I've been doing this for 25 or so years. This is not the first disaster I've seen. This is not the first time somebody has signed the back of the work or even the front of the work. Uh, and it's not the last. And so, you know, I was, I was shocked but not surprised. Um, I chose to blur out the signature or cover it with tape because I know the internet and I know, <laughs> let's just leave it at that. I know the internet and nobody deserves that kind of backlash or wrath even if they did something bad. It's just not productive or helpful, and it speaks to a vicious cycle um, that I just don't want to be part of. We all know that this work was bad. If that person knows that it was bad, fine. If they don't, it doesn't really matter. And there's no need for them to receive kind of all of the hate that the internet can direct at them. I know I've seen it, and it doesn't feel good, so I don't want to be part of that. So that's why I left it off. So I got a really great question. There are two things that I have to know. Firstly, the owner didn't have to pay for that butchery, right? Right? Also, did you reach out to this person and advise them that they should never go near a painting ever? I know that there'd be a strongly worded letter from me, but I'm a Brit and that's what we do. But seriously, do you have a place to report this person to? Yes, the client did pay for this work. Probably very little, but they did. And then they had to pay me to undo this work. 
I took that into consideration in the proposal and the quote because I don't like people to feel burned and even if that means that I have to take a little bit less, you know, there's a karmic right thing to do and not dragging this person over the, the coals kind of felt like the right thing to do. Um, but that's just the way I operate. Everybody does it differently. Did I reach out to the person? No, I didn't see any utility in that. This person is not going to listen to me. I'm not here to educate that person and teach them how to be a better conservator. And I frankly didn't want to have anything to do with this person. Uh, I could have gone to great lengths to chastise them on camera or in a letter or in an email or a phone call. But again, that is getting into the mud. And when you get into the mud, you also get dirty. And I didn't feel like I needed that in my life. So I just kind of said, you know what? It is what it is. My job is to move forward, deal with the painting, affect positive change, not to deal with how it got here. Now, unfortunately, there is no governing body in America for conservators. Yes, we have the American Institute for Conservation, but it's a membership-based group. And this person was not a member of the American Institute for Conservation. So reporting them has no utility. I know in Europe and in England and in other parts of the world, they do have guilds or um, governing bodies. And if you do perpetuate a transgression, I guess you could report it. Um, but again, that's, you know, that's stepping into a world of politics and vitriol that I just don't want to be part of. I live my life in this studio. I do my thing and let other people do theirs. Live and let live. And so, no, unfortunately, there was nothing I could do to report this person. Um, but I suspect that this person probably knows that they didn't do right. I hope they know. Maybe they'll see the video. <laughs> Who knows? So now let's talk about the front of the painting. How did it get like that? How did I know I could fix it? Was I shocked that there was really no damage? So when I saw the painting, I instantly knew that it was completely overpainted. And I talked about using ultraviolet light and not being able to see any difference. And that's where experience comes in. Like I said, I've been doing this for a long time and I've come across this before. So this isn't my first rodeo. And I approached it just like I've approached every other project, methodically. I made tests, I examined the piece, I looked at it under a microscope. I tried to gather as much information, as much data, as many dots, and then I started to connect them, started to understand what happened and with what materials and why. And that led me to solutions. And those solutions obviously were successful, but they weren't random. They weren't just guesses. They were all carefully prescribed based on the information that I gathered, not only from the painting, but historically from my work as a conservator. Now, if I had been new and didn't have this basis of knowledge, I would have reached out to other conservators. I would have done research. I would have asked people because that's what you do when you run into a challenge. You don't just throw your arms up and say, I don't know. You approach it methodically and you build up information. You build up knowledge that allows you to tackle it. And that's really one of the great things about my job is that when I run into these challenges, be it from the adhesive on the back or overpainting all over the front, or any of the other videos that I've done that challenge me, instead of quitting and saying, I don't know, I can't, the answer is, let's find out. Let's invent a solution. Let's build a tool. Let's use a new material. And in that process, this is the greatest job in the world because those challenges, you can either take them as obstacles or opportunities. And yeah, I know that sounds Pollyannish, but really you can either take them as uh, a rock in the road that you can't get around and you turn around and go home, or the opportunity to forge a new path. And along that path, you will discover something. Maybe you'll discover that this was too, too challenging, too much for you, but now you found a limit. Maybe you will discover that you are smarter and more creative than you thought. Kudos. Maybe you will discover something that you can't even fathom but it will teach you something about yourself, about the work you're doing, and from that process, you will come away smarter, stronger, and better. And so challenges are opportunities, and when we face them as such, we can find solutions. So that's how I approached these challenges. Now, 
I mentioned that I didn't use any infrared imaging or x-ray imaging to see beneath that top layer of paint. And there are a couple of reasons. One, we knew we were gonna clean it one way or the other. Two, the client told me that there was a painting underneath and that it was beautiful. I generally trust my clients. And three, there's a big expense to that. You know, x-ray imaging and infrared imaging is expensive. And this is already a pretty expensive project. And I didn't think that it was absolutely necessary for my client to spend more money when we were gonna remove this stuff anyways and find what we found. Now, when I started to remove it, I was absolutely flabbergasted that the painting was pretty much okay. There was nothing fundamentally wrong with it. Yeah, maybe it was a little skinned, there was a little bit of paint loss, it was old, so what? I was expecting half of the face to be missing. I was expecting massive losses or just horrific damage. I was fully prepared to have to rebuild this entire face. And luckily, I didn't have to. I mean, the retouching of this project took all but, I don't know, 20 minutes or something? Maybe, and I was looking for more work to retouch. But we got lucky in this case, and sometimes that happens. Now, that's not always the case, and as you have probably seen on many of my videos, <laughs> if it's a video, more often than not, it's not gonna be a good result. Something bad has happened. I generally don't film the projects where everything goes perfect and it's, you know, hunky-dory because they're boring. But this case, we got lucky. And that's a perfect point to bring in Mr. Paris's question. Have you ever found a painting retouched so bad or so damaged that upon cleaning you realized you were going to have to, quote, paint in the missing part? Oh, yes, all the time. All the time. <laughs> Paintings come in with massive damage and sometimes the old conservation work is good. Sometimes it was good, but it's, it's expired and it needs to be redone. Sometimes it was really bad and we remove it and then we get down to what's left and we go, geez, there's no foot. There is no face. And I have videos where I have had to recreate feet, hands, faces, and it's really difficult. It's, it's challenging as a practitioner, as an artist, as a conservator. It also runs into ethical questions about how much we're allowed to do. But ultimately, you know, I'm driven by my clients and if their desire is to see this painting whole, that's what I try to do. So, you know, if this painting had no eyes, I would have reached out to my client and said, we, look, we got a problem here. We got to figure out a solution. What would you like me to do? Honestly, most of the time they say, well, you're the expert. You do whatever it is you're going to do. And, uh, you know, that's both a, a great deal of trust they have in me and it's liberating, but it's also a lot to manage. Luckily, all the materials that I work with, the paints, the varnishes, the adhesives are archival and fully reversible. So if I don't like my work, I can remove it and I've done that in the past. Uh, if somebody else doesn't like my work, they can remove it, and I'm sure that that will be done in the future. And that's really why using the proper materials and approaches is critically, critically necessary. And how'd you like that twist at the end where there was a second portrait, her husband, who had also been conserved, though not as heavy-handedly, and also needed work? Well, again, we got lucky because he didn't receive the same treatment as she did. So yes, the entire background is overpainted and his face had been glazed in in parts, but it was much, much easier. But I included it because I wanted to show both paintings and I wanted to show how they're supposed to look together because it really is a pair. And I felt that that was important. I didn't make a video of it because again, it just wasn't that complicated, perhaps in the context of her being so complicated. But I thought it was a nice twist at the end, and I thought that you all, the audience, deserved to see it. And now one final question from Amy. For those of us nowhere near Chicago, how would you recommend finding and vetting a conservator restorer for ourselves to avoid bad work, even if it's not to this degree? You can certainly look up directories for whatever governing body is in your country, the American Institute for Conservation, if there's the one in England, one in France or Spain, so on and so forth. Some of those will be helpful, some may not. Again, the American Institute for Conservation, it's a membership organization, so some of the people there are students uh, on the directory, some are professionals. It's just an index. But I would say you should go about it like any practitioner you would hire, a plumber, an electrician, a mechanic. You gotta do your homework. 
You gotta ask questions. You gotta do the vetting yourself. So what are those questions? Are you using archival materials? Things that will not deteriorate in the future and cause harm. Are you using reversible materials? Things that are designed to be undone in the future with ease. Are you following modern conservation practices? Conservation has changed and is ever changing and best practices change with it. And the American Institute for Conservation has a code of ethics and a guideline for best practices. And if you're in America, you can certainly ask the practitioner if they are aware of that and if they follow that. If they don't, well, there's your answer. But finally, you're gonna to wanna to see their work. You wanna see examples. You wanna see before and after. You wanna go into their studio, see the work that they're working on. And ultimately, you just need to feel comfortable with that person. You wanna ask the questions and have them answered respectfully. You want the conservator to earn your business, give you time, explain what's happening, make you feel at ease. And if you are not at ease at any point during the research or the question asking process, well, there's your answer. You wouldn't let somebody into your home to watch your kids, to work on your plumbing, if you didn't trust them. If you didn't trust that they were gonna do good quality work, that they were upstanding people who respected you. It's no different than conservators. And once you find that person, build a relationship with them because you may need them in the future. And having a relationship with a service provider or a practitioner that you know and trust, well, if you are collecting paintings, you will then start to see paintings that otherwise looked too far gone or too risky, but you know somebody who can fix them and you trust them. So maybe you'll take a risk on a painting and be handsomely rewarded. Well, thanks for following along on the video and this epilogue. This is one of the things that I really, really enjoy because even though I try to cover all my bases with the videos, inevitably I miss something because I'm just a silly human. And sometimes the questions that I get asked are so sharp, so pointed, that they make me audit my process and become a better conservator. Sometimes they're funny and they make me laugh. Sometimes they're really touching and they kind of bring out all the feels. And it's one of the really great things about the Patreon. So if you found this video interesting, join the Patreon, take a look. There are epilogue videos for dozens upon dozens of my past conservations and there will be epilogue videos for my future conservations. So think up some good questions and try to catch me sleeping. I like the challenge. Anyhow, take care and I look forward to seeing y'all again on another epilogue.